put one underneath the uh, program.
It's about relationship building, truly listening to each other's point of view, trusting that we have all each other's best interests in our hearts, and calmly discuss our ways with the Lord and the We will succeed with that kind of thing. I know that we will. I believe in the city of Rock and I believe that we will do this. We've made great strides for the benefit of all of us. We focused on affordable housing, supporting local businesses, with help of Tech Airlines Gateway, finding inquiries from companies interested in building near the area and creating the vast economic development that we need to all be successful and prosperous. As Dr. Martin Luther King once said, love is creative and redemptive. Love builds up and unites, and tears down and destroys. Yes, love, which means understanding, creative, redemptive goodwill, even for one's enemy, is a solution. And our shared love for this city and our shared love for God, I know, will bring us to this place. I believe in God's amazing grace, and I believe in the future brought you now. I'm excited here to commemorate a very important event. It really has marked time and changed time as it relates to civil rights, as it, as it relates to um, so many things that are important. And I'm looking at the agenda. I know that uh, Councilman Knight, I know that Robert D. Maya here will cover a lot of ground on this. And so, but anyway, I'm again grateful to be here. I want to thank you. Thank you for being here. And I want to mention, as we told you, after this event, we're going to go outside and we're going to unveil uh, a plaque with this. And so I want everybody to be you know, aware of the progress of that and participate. So again, thank you very much for being here for this very important event. Almighty God, we come to tell you thank you because you are the author and the finisher of our lives. Yes, sir. We thank you, Lord, that you made it possible through many of those that caused Dr. Martin Luther King's journey to come by this historical place and to pause long enough to tell us, oh God, that he has a dream, God. And Lord, we thank you that that dream is still becoming a reality for all of your people. And we just stop by today, God, to let you know and let the visionary know that even though it might tarry, it has not been forgotten. And we bless you for this privilege now, God. And we thank you that we stopped by. Thank you for every representation that caused that night, that moment to happen. And thank you for that moment in time that has launched us into history. And we bless you for it. And Lord, we thank you for the unveiling today that will be here for future generations, that when they pass by this place, they will know that the vision and the dream and the reality of life is still on the path to reality. We bless you in Jesus' name. Let the Redeemer of the Lord say amen. 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 about the educational 
conditions here in Rocky Mountain, they were poor, the facilities were poor, they were underfunded, there were segregated schools in Rocky Mountain like most southern towns and cities. They were concerned about the quality of life for black residents in Rocky Mountain, such as housing, jobs, fair wages. Reverend Dudley saw this disappointment in the struggles of blacks and the lack of concern from some white leadership in the business community. Reverend Dudley saw the fight for the local NAACP and even wrote in a letter that he was trying to get some new life in our local branch of the NAACP here in Rocky Mountain and to get into our people a sense of citizenship. Blacks in Rocky Mountain, like most southern towns and cities, felt like second-class citizens. They felt that America had given its colored people a bad check, a check that has come back marked insufficient. But they refused to believe that the bank of injustice was bankrupt. Here in Rocky Mountain, they refused to believe that the insufficient funds in the great vaults of opportunity of this nation didn't have money for African Americans. It was here in Rocky Mountain that we had no blacks on the city council. We had segregated schools. Most of the jobs were domestic work, farm work, share property poor housing conditions, and a lot of people feared the terror of white supremacy. Even J.B. Herring, during that time, he wrote in the Carolinian newspaper. And he was the secretary and historical, historical, historian of the Rocky Mount branch of the NAACP. Actually, he took the pictures of when Dr. King came here in Rocky Mount. But Dr. But, but J.B. Herring uh, wrote in a newspaper that he was threatened. And they stated that if you continue to write these truths in this newspaper, he was going to bomb your house, which he lived on Pennsylvania Avenue. Dr. Jason Miller even wrote in his book that it was unclear how King came to accept the invitation to appear here in 1962, but I believe I have that answer today. It was ordained by God that Dr. King would come here, and he would come and he would meet Reverend Dutton, and he would come and preach to the people here in the city of Rocky Mountain. Dr. King and Reverend Dutton was friends in Atlanta. It was God's plan that King would come to this gymnasium here at Booker T. Washington High School and speak to more than 500 or more citizens to give them hope, encouragement, and strength. It is recorded in history that Rocky Mountain now is now the site of a historical moment in our nation's history. God knew that Reverend Dutton would be the first black city council member. God knew that the lady that prepared him a meal, Helen Gay, would be the first African-American woman on the city council. God knew that he was preparing Naomi Green, Sue Perry, Shelly Willingham, uh, George Dickens, and many others Come on, to file a lawsuit against Rocky Mountain for fair political representation, which now it has taken over 30 years or more to have a majority African-American city council. We cannot take that lightly. God knew that one day he would be preparing people to continue the struggle and to fight for justice, inclusion, e equality, and equity, and prosperity for all. I know I had two minutes with you, but I forgot it. Since the pandemic, some of us have been to church, so I think I'm giving the sermon, but I'm going to end there. It was not by accident that Dr. King came here. So I want you all to know that the strides that we have made, we can't sell our souls. We can't sell our votes. But we must fight for equality and fight for the rights and fight for those who have no voice in the voices. 
That's why Dr. King came here. And that's why we're here, because we stand on his shoulders. I don't want to thank you for coming to this program and thank the city of Rocky Mount, Councilman Blackwell, for seeing this vision that we need to come together and celebrate and commemorate uh, this day of the 60th anniversary of Dr. King's speech, I Have a Dream. Thank you.
my perspective of the Martin Luther King speech and why it meant so much and why it was so important right here in Rocky Mountain. In 1962, when Martin Luther King Jr. gave his speech here in Rocky Mountain, I was a senior at the Booker T. Washington High School right here. And they realized that bringing a man such as Martin Luther King Jr. here to Rocky Mountain, that the Booker T. Auditorium, where we mostly had most of our things, were just not being large enough. So that's why they decided to bring everything here into the gymnasium. And just to give you a little bit of perspective, our Booker T. Washington High School at that time was somewhat what they call all black school. Uh, during that time, everything was segregated. Not just the school, but even down to the restaurants that we graciously enjoy now. But during that time, uh, we weren't even able to go to the restaurant without a choice or to a movie here in Rocky Mountain or the different other activities that was for everyone. And so you ask the question of why did Martin Luther King decide to come here other than the request of the, uh, the, the river uh, from uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church was the fact that even though Martin Luther King had got to be very, very noticeable, very famous, and everybody recognized what he was doing for the United States and the people of color, a lot of people, they only would look at Alabama, Georgia, but the same thing that these people were going through we were actually going through the same things here in Rocky Mountain. Now, I can tell you uh, how bad it was for me because I was raised in Weeks Armstrong projects. And in Weeks Armstrong projects, you get to go to the projects about the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. coming here in Rocky Mountain. But one thing, he was such a big name that people couldn't uh, comprehend that such a big name as Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would come to Rocky Mountain for some little time. But the news spread quickly. You know, uh, that was back in the time we had the black and white TV and everybody was listening, listening to the radio. But everybody was aware that Martin Luther King Jr. was actually coming to Rocky Mountain. And the people and the police department were so afraid of his life that they actually picked him up uh, out on the interstate and, and escorted him all the way in to Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. Now, as a teenager, I was 17 at the time, and uh, I was real excited and just thrilled at the fact that Martin Luther King was coming. You have to realize that I understood everything that we were going through. I understood the poverty, the different things that we were going through, I even actually participated in a boycott of Belt Towers, uh, which was in May, on Main Street, which we now call Belts, but we boycotted them because they uh, wouldn't hire any people uh, as salespeople or anything like that. So I told you all of that to let you know that uh, we were actually really going through something and we needed somebody to give us a spot, a spot to prep us up, to make us feel that there was hope 
right here in Rocky Mountain. And I want to tell you that uh, I came a little bit early thinking that um, I would be able to get a good seat. Well, actually, I was actually seated somewhere over here. And when I walked in from this door here, it was so crowded. I mean, there were people everywhere. They had those benches pulled out on each side, and they had chairs all over. And uh, the anticipation of actually seeing Dr. Martin Luther King, you could see the reaction on the faces of the people that were here. Well, when Martin Luther King came in, they had a stage over there, and Martin Luther King came in uh, from that door back over there. And when he came in, uh, he was not the only one, there were several of them, but Dr. Martin Luther King was in the middle. And when they marched on the stage, and when the people actually saw the face of Dr. Martin Luther King, everybody was just elated and everybody clapped. And you can just imagine how excited everybody was. And to be, be there at that particular time, and when Martin Luther King actually got on the stage to speak, the applause was great before even one word came out of his mouth. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. here in Rocky Mount, North Carolina. He was a man that gave us hope. He was a man that risked his own life. He was a godly man. And he believed, and I believe, that his presence was a call from God. But when he began to speak, everybody was quiet until the end of the sentence. And then everybody just clapped and joined and I didn't realize it at the time. Mom Luther King started talking. And he started talking about, I have a dream. I have a dream. And you know, when you think about it, with everything that was going on, he could have been talking hate. He could have been talking uh, down, frightened words. But Martin Luther King, he came in with the idea that we have a dream that all people, black, white, Jew, Gentile, could all come together and live as one. He didn't preach hate. He didn't come in talking about hate. He came in talking about love. He came in talking about how we can all get together and live as one. And I think it was one of the greatest things uh, as far as Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. And I realized that uh, all of that spread all over the country, what he did. And later, when he did in Washington, and he was saying, I have a dream. And it came to me, and I thought about it. I said, you know, I, I've heard, I've heard that. But it wasn't the, it wasn't the exact speech, but some of the things that he was saying right here in Rocky Mountain, but some of the things that he had said then. And I just want y'all to know that I was so glad, so proud to see him. I was so glad to have been able to actually see him and hear him in person for my own self. And I thank y'all for having me.
but Reverend George Dutton, Mrs. Helen Gay, and that was before she was city councilwoman Helen Gay. Uh, Dr. Armstrong, Mrs. Vivian Tillman, uh, and then as we move forward, we honor Mr. Clarence Wiggins, Mr. Leonard Wiggins, Reverend Lee, Reverend John L. Thorne, Reverend Thomas Walker, and then I, I honor Sam here, Sam Gray. I honor Mr. Sam Gray. I wanted to mention his name because it was he was serving as director of Rocky Mountain Human Relations Department. And he referred me to Edgecombe County Department of Social Services many years later. Because when I finished Booker T, I moved to New York. Everybody went someplace. And when I came back from New York as a young woman, I went to Human Relations at Rocky Mountain. Sam Gray was there. He referred me to social services, and that's where I got my first job in Rocky Mountain. My work in Rocky Mountain has always been for social services. And I wanted to thank Reverend Walker because when I left social services, I went to Ebenezer Baptist Church. And at that point, and from then on, I started implementing the dream that Dr. King had put in our heart. Because he put some stuff in our hearts that night. Yes, he did. For, for a lot of people that night, and this room was full, and he put, up, put some stuff in people's hearts all over America. He gave us courage, he gave us strength, he gave us vision, and so I appreciate him for that. I also wanted to thank the Board of Directors for the Rocky Mountain Edgecombe CDC, who believed in the African American community and in my dreams for improving our lives. The late Reverend Attorney Antonio Lawrence, I wanted to call Tony's name, because Antonio Lawrence was a powerful warrior and a powerful attorney in this town. He That's chaired right. the Rocky Mountain Edgecombe CDC. Uh, Susan Perry Cole, Attorney Susan Perry Cole, uh, Mr. Bob Barnes, Mr. Harold Lynch, Ms. Sylvia Austin, Ms. Ethel Best, Ms. Lorraine Williams, and the staff of the Rocky Mountain Edgecombe CDC. We've been working now for 31 years. Can you believe that? 31 years we've been working together. 34 years. And God has blessed our effort. Since 1988, we followed the model that Dr. King set, and thousands of people and communities have been blessed. My personal path has been a calling. Many sectors of my life has followed the model of Dr. King, building faith institutions, community development, and voting rights. My work and the work of the Rocky Mountain Edgecombe CDC includes uh, Edgecombe County Department of Social Services on their staff and their board. I remember being a staff person and filing the first lawsuit against Edgecombe County for baby hard black people and then smoke black people. And the board of directors of Edgecombe County. I chaired the Board of Elections for Edgecombe County for voting rights for the people of our city. Ebenezer Baptist Church as administrator, and I supported Dr. Walker when we built the church, when we carried out the program there. Leadership development, community development, the work of the Rocky Mount Edgecombe CDC has been a blessing to thousands of people. The Rocky Mount Edgecombe CDC has built homes for, homes, homes for the homeless, selling and renting to address the needs of many and to address flood victims. So far, we've built 205 homes in Rocky Mountain, 77 for home ownership and 128 apartments. We've completed home ownership counseling for the sale of another 207 homes, and many families have been served, including over 3,000 for Hurricane Floyd, 3,500 for pre-purchase counseling, uh, 1,800 for foreclosure mitigation, and we've saved about 1,200 homes from people losing their homes because of uh, foreclosure. In real estate development, we've developed the Harambe Square, which is 24 apartments downtown and 13,000 square feet of commercial space for rent. We work with the city in partnership with the city and Mr. Barney uh, in doing Douglas Block. Mixed use development, where we build eight apartments and revitalize the whole Douglas Block project. Edgecombe County Business Industrial Incubator for 40,000 square foot building. And out there, at the maximum out there, we had between 220 and 250 jobs, which included Department of Revenue, 175 jobs, Connect Inc., 25 jobs, Workforce Development, six jobs, North Carolina Association of CDCs, five jobs, business suites. We're now working on crossing at 64 mixed use development out on uh, Raleigh Street. Bojangles is up. The Kidney Center is up, and we just sold a piece of land to a chicken restaurant, Checkers. Yeah. It, it looks like it's taken a 
lot of time, and it does take a lot of time, y'all. It takes a lot of time, takes a lot of money, takes a lot of effort, takes a lot of praying to get something done. Because since, since we got started, things have flipped. From 1988 to 2022, everybody take your money now. Hmm. During our time of getting started, look, they didn't put, nobody wanted your money. We wanted your money. And we had to fight for it and build for it and try for it. And for homes, we've done um, 20, 36 homes at Genesis Estates, which is home ownership, 72 apartments at Thornbridge Apartments. Um, Holly Street, we've got 18 apartments, and we've got 10 homes that are uh, home ownership. In Pine Top, we built 26 homes. Whitaker's one, Princeville two, Sunset Avenue four apartments, Main Street two, Heritage Park eight. God has blessed the efforts and the work of these few people, few staff, few board members to follow Dr. King's dream. So that's what I, I just want to tell you that today, that I'm 75, I'm looking at retirement. I want this work to continue. We still need, we need homes, we need businesses, we need jobs, and we need you to help us. Amen. That's the truth. Help is needed. Help is needed. I just have to say that. Dr. King's dream was to use community economic development strategies to create all these things that we want and we need. Dr. King visited Rocky Mount, visit to Rocky Mount had great results, and we continue to work to build economic impact from the teaching. One of his quotes that, that, that we use is, and he said, you don't have to have a college degree to serve. You don't have to make your subject and verb agree to serve. You only need a heart full of grace and a soul generated by love. We ask you to generate love. We need to continue to dream and to build, to continue to participate, to work, to vote, to get out the vote. We need to continue to to uh, support city council and county commissioners. We need to go to city council meetings and county commissioners meetings. We need to talk to our people to represent us. We need to join hands and work together to build a better community. We do. We need to work together to build a better community. It's time to keep moving and working. Um, Sue reminded me of the election in Atlanta. If you know somebody in Atlanta, encourage them to get out and vote. You know who to tell them to vote for. You know who's willing to work for you. So get out to vote. That election in Atlanta is key. The election across America is key. So you become active with your family become active. Work, it's, it's time to keep building. It's time to keep, keep, keep giving. It's not the time to give up. It's time to keep trying. It's time to keep serving. It's time to keep working. It's time to keep dreaming. Keep implementing Dr. King's dream. That's what we need to do. Let's just keep implementing his dream. Let's keep implementing. Let's keep trying to build jobs, build homes, build families, support your family, support your politician. It's time to do what we have to do to make things better for all of us in Rocky Mountain. I have a dream. I have a dream. I'm 75 years old. I've been working since I was 15. And I still have the same dream. I would love to see more housing in Rocky Mountain. I would love to see more representation in our city and our county. More businesses, more jobs, less poverty, less, less crime, less fighting. But who's going to do it? We're going to do it. We're going to do it. All of us. We have a dream. Y'all going to work with us? Going to continue to work? All right. Thank you very much.
at Morehouse College. Men of the house and Morehouse men always refer to him as our elder brother. We take into consideration everything that he had to say and what he was about. On November 27, 1962, 60 years ago, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King delivered the earliest incarnation of his now iconic I Have a Dream speech in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina, in this historic place. Dr. King is, of course, my elder Morehouse brother, but I also have another connection in that um, right up the street here, 1620 East Virginia Street, the uh, first house in Mayview that my parents built there. I lived beside the Reverend George Washington Teller. I grew up beside him. The night that, or uh, the day that Reverend uh, King made the speech, my mother remembers that she was across the street at the home of Mr. Joe Ray. And uh, at that time, East Virginia Street was a dirt street. It was dirt. And uh, the Klan came that night. Miss Dudley came out with uh, an apron. She had an apron on with uh, shotgun shells in both pockets. Okay. <laughs> a shotgun across her, across her arm. Amen. Mr. Ray walked out and said, Ms. Dudley, do you need any help? She said, no, son, I don't need any help. She said, I got all the help that I need right here in my hand. Ms. Dudley was unafraid. The people of Rocky Mountain were unafraid. That's right. Mount Zion First Baptist Church under the pastor of the late Reverend George Washington Dudley was instrumental in bringing his friend, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, to Rocky Mountain at a time when racial tension and the issue of integration were at the forefront of American discourse. That was 60 years ago. And yet 60 years later, the question lingers, how far have we come in race relations in that time period? What progress has been made? If this is to be decided by the extent to which we have eliminated racial injustice and inequality, then the easy answer is we haven't progressed that far at all. I thank the city of Rocky Mountain for this opportunity. However, what I say next, I neither feel any trepidation, apprehension, nor need for apologies. Of the aforementioned contention, I and many others contend that our slothful progression toward justice and equality has a lot to do with the naivete that many Americans, including those who are well-meaning, and especially those who are in power, have allowed to languish and thus have brought into and promoted the utopic concepts of colorblindness and the melting pot society. <laughs> These propagations of colorblindness, not seeing race, and a melting pot society where everybody becomes one sounds good, look attractive, and are phraseologically catchy, and have become popular to the point that we refuse to even question whether or not this was even King's contention. But what Martin Luther King Jr. Even, was even talking about, was he even talking about a colorblind or melting pot society? And are they the vehicles that should be employed to realize what we or what he was suggesting? The reality, however, is that Dr. King's dreamed of a society that does not judge people by the color of their skin. He did not dream of a society that no longer sees color. That's the difference. The reality is that Dr. King dreamed of a society that truly believes in the notion that all humans are created equal. He did not dream of a society lacking in diversity wherein all humans are the same. There is a big difference. We have to understand, I, I think that there has to be a, a, an understanding here that we cannot 
allow anyone to put Dr. King in a dream state only. Before we even talk about being woke, Dr. King was woke. And yet we have allowed external forces to force us to see him as only I have a dream. But Dr. King was an advocate for fair housing. He was an advocate for fair resources. He was against war. This was Dr. King too. And whenever we allow ourselves to see him only as I have a dream, then we bastardize the very speech itself. I have a dream with the hyperbole. Obviously, we didn't listen to the first part of the speech. I have a dream was a very small part of a larger idea. And I know I'm going to get in trouble. I'm going to get in We commemorate, yes, today, 60 years since I have a dream in Rocky Mountain, North Carolina. I think that is a great thing. I think that, that we should do that. We don't need to get caught up in believing that Dr. King was only about dreaming. He was talking about working. He was talking about us getting out and, and putting our hands in the plow and getting the work done. But there are so many. There are those who want us to remain in a dream state because as long as you're dreaming, you're not working. As long as you're dreaming, you're almost in a state of sleep. You want to know why people are still not getting out and voting? Because we have allowed ourselves to become and be in a dream state. Dr. King was more than I have a dream. Racism is not about color. It's not. Racism is an economic thing. It deals with denying people access when you codify. We need to be more engaged. We need to do some, uh, literally, some intellectual enterprise into understanding what I Have a Dream was all about. And until we do that, until we take that intellectual enterprise, until we do that intellectual work, until we literally know who Dr. King was and what he was about, we will never understand his purpose and his mission. Nobody mad at me right now. But I'm a preacher. Like Dr. King. Who read the word and understands that we are compelled to speak truth to power. And as my professor, the Reverend Dr. Lawrence Zimbel Carter of the Morehouse uh, the Martin Luther King Institute denomination of the chapel said, we are not only compelled to speak truth to power, but we are compelled to speak with power the truth. Yeah. And so it has to be said. Dr. King was coming here because he needed us to understand something, that we have the power to make the change that we so 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 earnestly desired. We don't have to depend on anybody else to do it for us. That we have the intellectual capacity, we have all of those things to do it ourselves. The only thing that Dr. King was asking for, he was asking for equal access. 
He was asking for, for us to have the same resources. He, he wasn't necessarily saying that, uh, um, that once we were able to go into the same restaurant that we were eating. Because we found out that ain't true. I understand that somebody wanted the strawberry shortcake. But I hope to open it. That is the reality. That is, that, that, that is what we must understand above all else. The Dr. King was more than a dreamer. Moses stood at the top of the mountain. He was able to, to see the promised land, but because of some things that he had done previously, he wasn't able to go into it. But do you believe that Moses wanted the children of Israel to wander around in the wilderness for 40 years? Do you think Dr. King wanted us to be killing one another? Do you think he wanted us not to have equal access, to have our communities under resource, to not be able to speak truth to God? Do you believe that that is what he wanted? That he wanted there to be war and us not to speak against it. For us to look into our native Africa and to see countries still being exploited for their resources. Do you believe that that was the dream? That that was Dr. King? So do you believe that? I got some $3 bills that I'll give to you. Dr. King wanted so much more for us. And I'm sure there's someone that will say, how is it that you can give such a scathing analysis? Can you imagine if he would give what analysis he would give? He would be so very disappointed in all of us. In the first part of the speech, Dr. King talked about the tranquilizing drug of gravity. That still exists today. You have that pusher out there who is saying, no, wait. No, it's not time. But if it's not time to do it now, when will it ever be time to get it done? I didn't want you to come in today and, and, uh, and give you a kumbaya speech. <laughs> I wanted to come in today. I wanted you to really take an opportunity to go back home and think about it. I wanted you to take the opportunity to go and really read that thing. Read the drum major instinct. Read I Have a Dream, all of it. Read about what he talked about when he talked about the Vietnam War and, and, and how he was against war altogether. Go and read about uh, how Dr. King talked about poverty and how we, how we could resource our communities. Go, 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 go read that. And then think about this. And I'm present company too. There is a greater effort for us to see him as only I have a dream by the very people who initially said crucify him. <laughs> so then when we look at it, we realize that it is a nefarious thing. It's not so much that they want us to see Dr. King as I have a dream, it's that they want to keep us in the dream state. They want to keep us talking about what might be when we are existing in a time of what can be. All of the, the things, all the progress that we have, all of the things that we have done, and I, I can't deny that we have come a long way. But I have to say that we have so far so very far to go before we can even think about 
dealing with I have a dream in Dr. King. We need to keep our children in school. We need to promote love amongst our citizens. We must stop killing each other. Um, I want, am I any other elected officials? I think I saw Sherry. Yeah. 
Ashley Atkinson here. I think I saw you coming. Thank you so much for, for being here and for taking your time. I want to also give honor to our own chief, uh, Robert Hapsel, and I thank um, the assistant city manager, uh, Elton Daniel, for being here. It takes a team, Jeff, Jeff Rose, working together to correctly interpret the law. <laughs> you hear what I said? Correctly interpreting the law. You know, I want to thank that. I want to thank you for all of that. Um, Jason Miller, um, really, who you didn't discover, but you gave light to what we already knew, that something significant took place in this location. And, and Jason, um, I want to ask, are you still here? Are you? Okay, there you are. And Jason, Jason, Dr. Miller is the professor in the state. Um, thank you. Thank you for unveiling us to the world. Because I think that's what Jason did. He unveiled what already took place. Uh, but what I also want to say, Rocky Mount, is that you drew the presence of greatness here. You drew the presence of greatness here. And because of the potential that was existing beneath the surface of oppression that separated and oppression that kept dreams deferred, your press opened up the door for the rest of America and the world to be inspired to do great things. I, I so appreciate Joyce Dickens and how she methodically laid out the series of successes that she and her team have made possible for Rocky Mountain. And what we don't see, what we don't hear, is what it took to make all that take place. All we can see is the work after it has been done. But you don't know the hours and the conversations and the no's and the unbelief and the tears and the anger and the discouragement that she and her team have had to work through just to pierce the veil of possibility. And when we look in our city and in other cities across this country, we got to recognize that we didn't get here on our own. So as we shift to the next generation, as the mantle is being taken off of one shoulder and put on the other shoulder, all we can say is do not disrespect the sacrifice that created the anointing in which you are able to walk and do greater. Because the truth of the matter, greater is needed. Greater is needed. Dr. King recognized that he had to sacrifice family, friends, comfort, and, and, and being accepted yes. in order to create an opportunity for a momentum to take place that would shift and change the dynamics of a country who was mired in the history of violence, mired in the history of inequities, and mired in the acceptance that some people are better than other people. And today we still live, don't we tell the truth? We still live. We wake up with a feeling that it's okay for some folk to have to do certain things and other folk to have opportunities that everybody can't have. So the work is still yet to be done. And, and Jason, what I really want to appreciate you for more than anything else is connecting the tie between Dr. King and the Harlem Renaissance. Yes. Well, what does that mean? King never ran for an office, did he? Never ran for an office. He was a pastor, but he didn't stay in the pulpit. He was a man of letters, but he was not noted as, a, as an artistic leader. But he had a unique relationship with the men and the women 
who changed the world's opinion through the arts about who black people were. And the most significant statement I think that I could make today is just by repeating a poem called Harlem that was written by Langston Hughes, yeah, Brother right. Langston Hughes. What happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun? Or fester like a sword and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat? Or crust and sugar roll like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Rocky Mountain, what are we going to do with our dream? What do we do so we do not explode? God bless you. We thank you for your attention and your time. Uh, we do have a musical tribute that we'd like to um, ask you to enjoy. We want to welcome uh, Miss Lucretia Glass Luton and her team of musicians this morning that have a tribute to give to 60 years of history, 60 years of progress, and the time ahead of us to change and make things better. God bless you, and thank you so much. God bless you. Thank you.
so much. What a phenomenal way to bring a close to this part of the program. I want to also thank Selena Parker on saxophone, Mark Green on guitar, and Chris Farmer playing the keyboard. Thank you, Sister Lucy. I also would like to say before Reverend Betts uh, closes us out in prayer that there will be an unveiling um, right around the corner. Kirk, what are the instructions for that? One. Okay. Okay, so okay, so the veil is already done. The veil has been ready too. All right. <laughs> so would you join us, please, with as we take pictures and be careful. It's a little muddy out there, rain. So you know, for the high heels or the, the high shine, you know, you you know just be, be be careful about that. But please join us around the corner um, as we you know kick off the formal picture. And and would like all the mayor, mayor, mayor Robinson. Robertson, City Council members, yet all of you, all of us, we want to take a picture, united by United. Okay, Reverend Banks, here we go. First of all, I'd like to make a couple of announcements. First of all, I'd like to offer special thanks to our city leaders who supported this historic occasion that occurred over 60 years ago in our great city. Also, I want to remind us of our 2023 will mark the 35th year of the Martin Luther King Jr. Commission, honoring the Martin Luther King's birthday. The thing, the time is right. The 2023 series of the The 35th oratorical competition will be Saturday. January the 7th at 9 a.m. in the Imperial Center for the Arts. Also, the middle school 6th through 8th grade theme will be the time is right to always do what is right. The high school grades 9 through 12 theme, the time is right. Also, the 35th annual Unity Breakfast will be January 16th at the Rocky Mountain Event Center. The keynote speaker will be Congressman G.K. Butterfield, a lifelong resident of Eastern North Carolina, raised in Wilson, North Carolina. Represented the North Carolina Congressional District from 2004 until 2022. The breakfast will start at 7 a.m., the program at 8 a.m. The day of service project will take place following the program in various locations throughout the city. Also, the International Festival of Culture, the date is to be announced. We want to thank each one of you for being out today, and I want to personally thank all of our speakers, all our representatives, for the wonderful, wonderful words you have let us pray, our Father and our God in heaven, we are so thankful to you for allowing us this great privilege to hear, to hear from various speakers, their thoughts and their hearts, desires. We thank you, O God, for the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. and his dream for a better world for all of the creation. God, help us to keep that dream alive and thrive. Let us never forget that you love the whole world and so much so that you sent your only son, Jesus, you, that the world might be saved. Bless those who continue to push for the efforts of the rights of all mankind and continue, our, continue to bless our city to, to make each individual a beacon of light for hope and change. We thank you, O God, for the Martin Luther King Commission, for the work that we continue to do. Bless our city, bless our nation, bless every one of us, for all of us stand in need of your blessing. Continue to keep us ever in your keeping care, and help us, O God, to keep the dream alive, to bring peace, love, and hope to all of humanity, and thy soul.
Son's name we pray. Amen. Yeah, I'm good.
Son was tough on that, that coming through the light. What's mm -hmm. tough in that one? Oh, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't Sorry, we got better now. Hey, that's me. That's me. Hey, brother. No, it's not used to the way the angle and everything. Wow. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, you got to be dead on kind of yeah. get up straight with it. I'm just going to sit down and focus. <laughs> That's right. Uh -huh. That changes photography, doesn't it? Uh -huh. Especially with buildings and stuff like that, when you get cold and stuff like that. Right. Go back in there and straighten them up. Uh -huh. If don't, that means you, you got to get higher and higher. Right. See, I got it.
Mr. Dan, they need to put you on payroll. But you be catching every man. You're a man over there. What do you mean? I hear me, you guys come back up. We're good. We're good. We're good. We're good. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, our, our, our photo is up here, so if I can get everyone to shift, shift. down. Right. So that's what I want. That great. Right. Oh, I got you. Don't worry. Oh, no, you fine. Oh, don't worry about me. I just I hope they will shift over. I'm trying to see if I don't have any windows. If I can get... Well, I think we'll do that too. I'd like to be able to... I'm going to get this stuff right here. Let me hold it. That's right. 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 That's Let me see. Y'all give me just one minute. This is a pretty good sized crowd. Man with the glasses. If I can get between these two rows, between the two rows, between the two rows. Uh-uh. Andre, y'all need to bring that over. This one. There you go. Yeah, this stuff. Um, let's see. Let's see. Need to sit back under the sun. I need to go back some. I need to go back some because of the sun. Y'all gonna need to go back about three foot. The sun's gonna They need to go back. All right. If I can get everybody to take five steps work. We'll five see. Steps. We'll try. We'll try. Let's go five steps backwards. My camera folks is saying we need to go back. Watch the mud. We gotta get past the sun up here. So right there is where it's creeping out. Mm -hmm. Right there. I don't have a camera up here. Y'all need to get everybody to Will that work? Yes. We good? My, my camera folks? All right. I'm going to have you look right here at this, at Mr. Manley. Um, oh, sorry. All right, we're going to count and then down we're, we're, We'll and do over. more than one. So we're going to start here and then we'll do others, I promise. Okay? And I'm Mr. Manley in three, two, one. He's going to take several, so give him a moment. Me and yep. Let me know when you're good. I'm good. All right. Now, if you will, you can come stand center. All right, if you will, on the telegram. In three, two, one. Oh, wait, he's not ready. Hang on. Let me know when you're ready. Almost there. Five, four, three, two, one. All right. Um, hold on. Do we have anybody else? Sir, here? Do you want to come center and take a center picture? You're more than welcome to. Come on in. And you as well. All right. On this gentleman in the silver, in three, two, one. Thank you. you can take as many as you need. All right, this is the Tele Spring Hope. On her, please, in three, two, one. Anyone else? Did you want one? Right here? Thank you. Okay, right here, in three, two, one. one wait one moment. 
Did you mean? I'm good. I'm good. You I'm good? good. Anybody else? I believe we are good. Thank you very much.
I'm an old England teacher. So I better be.